Uh, we're kind of moving in a new bull here, 2025. It's possible that this will occur coinciding with lower interest rates and more money printing, which we had in a big way in 2020. So the monetary base industry increased 10 trillion, which is just insane, past 2032. And you're getting somewhere around the 70, 80 trillion dollar value. And it's somewhere around there that I think Bitcoin will meet that value. You see that Bitcoin is growing way, way faster than the monetary base. Even though we talk about they print a lot of money, it's only 12.7% per year. Here, Bitcoin grows at 45% per year. One big nation state decides to say, all right, we're going to start reserving Bitcoin. We're going to put it on our books. And then that just sends the demand for Bitcoin through the roof. Markets can be more irrational for longer than you have capital. <laughs> it's like a nominal value of gold for the United States. Very small. And people even wonder if it's even there. That's why Bitcoin's a great safe haven, right? It's just a great place to escape from all this noise. They're going to have to buy more assets if they want to keep these interest rates coming lower. And if they do that, then Bitcoin might line up perfectly in the next cycle, 2024, 2025. You know, that means 30 cents out of every dollar was basically printed by the central bank. That is a record. It's number five. It has passed the Bank of England's balance sheet. You have the dollar, you have the euro, you have the yen, you have the yuan. After that, you have now Bitcoin at 1.2 trillion. The first thing I want, really want to get into is uh, nation, nation state adoption of Bitcoin. It seems to be a, a faster and faster coming topic. Like in 2021, 2020, we had the, the companies adopting Bitcoin, the publicly traded companies with MicroStrategy, Tesla, and all the other things that came after that. Uh, and now we seem to end in a new era where like nation states and the US is talking about it. How fast do you think this all will come and how will this develop for the nation states adopting Bitcoin as a strategic reserve asset? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, you know, the old saying gradually and then suddenly, uh, it seems it happens that way in finance and markets. Uh, and perhaps, perhaps a betting man would take that it's going to be somewhat of a similar scenario, I think here with this, as far as when that suddenly actually occurs, I think it's difficult to tell. Um, this next round of Bitcoin adoption, which I'm generally measuring as far as, you know, most people know these four year cycles that come after the halving and uh, we're kind of moving into perhaps a new bull here, right? Going into 2025. It's possible that this will occur coinciding with lower interest rates and more money printing, which we had in a big way in uh, 2020 and 2021, we did, but we, uh, we had never really had that before in Bitcoin's history. So it would be interesting if Bitcoin kind of repeats what happened in 2020 and 2021, and all of a sudden we're sort of lined up with these cycles of basically central banks print more money to deal with whatever problems they might see in the economy. And then Bitcoin, you know, gets these next level up phases of adoption during these times. Uh, this would be the second time that this would have happened, right? And if this happens indeed on these four-year cycles, it would be, it would be interesting. Um, I, can, I can draw some trend lines for you on those possibilities. We can talk about that. But um, I think if you look at these uh, things in these four-year cycles and you look at the trend lines that Bitcoin uh, currently is on, uh, I think it's probably, you're not going to match what is what is uh, called base money of the nation states, monetary um, liabilities on their balance sheet, probably for another 10 years, probably for another two halvings at least. Uh, that's my view. Uh, and then, you know, we could talk about sort of the numbers that might back that up. But that's that's generally my my take on on how this uh, this stuff could work. So uh, a couple more cycles. It's also interesting, uh, the term base money, I think uh, it's even, I think it's your Twitter handle even, like one base money, uh, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. Uh, what, what does base money mean for those who don't know about it? Yeah, yeah. So when uh, I started my podcast in 2017, uh, we were, my, my former co-host uh, is a gentleman named Fernando Ulrich. He has a good YouTube channel down in Brazil uh, now. And he um, and I were 
asking a lot of economists what they thought Bitcoin was ontologically, you know, sort of an apples to apples comparison with other things in the market. What does it actually, what does it actually mean? Uh, Bitcoin, you know, the supply of 21 million Bitcoin, what does it actually mean in, in, in the real world economy? Some comparisons. And we perhaps were the first people that settled on this idea that it was, uh, it was, it was what is called base money or the monetary base supply. And what that is, is basically two things. The first thing most people understand, it's whatever the cash that a central bank uh, prints that they hold usually in their, in their wallet or under their mattress or in a, in a safe. Um, so all the euros, yen, dollars, the actual physical currency, that is part of the monetary base. And then the other part is it's called the bank reserve. And the bank reserve is basically each bank's in a central bank system. So in Europe, for example, you know, you have the, uh, we have, a, we have actually a two tiered system in Europe, right? We have each, each nation in Europe has the, in the Eurozone, of course, I'm speaking about, we have, you know, the Bundesbank in Germany. And then above that, we have the ECB in Frankfurt, the European central bank. And of course, uh, all of those, uh, banks that are in Europe, you know, Societe Generale or, um, you know, I don't even know what Spar Spar Bank, right? What's a what's a big German bank? Yeah, the, the the Deutsche Bank. I think it's one of the the biggest one. Deutsche Bank, of course. So, uh, anyway, all of these banks they have an account with the central bank, and that's called the, the actual account that they hold with the central bank. It's called the master account sometimes, or the main account. Uh, the value that is in that account is is the digital portion of the base money and that's called the bank reserves so so to summarize monetary base means all the physical currency in circulation cash and coins and the bank reserves which uh is each uh, each bank that has a charter in in the banking system their account with the central bank so if you add all those things up you can kind of get a flavor of what competes with bitcoin today at the core of the financial system and uh, it's one of the things I've been doing for, for a few years now. Since about 2018, I've been putting these reports out every quarter, which I'm basically going through all the central bank's balance sheets, trying to calculate the stuff, the monetary base. And um, we just finished the third quarter. It's going to take a while, uh, about a month to get the next quarter out, but it's done as of June. And that money, that all that money together roughly is about $26.1 trillion as of... Uh, as of the Q2 2024. So, and, so that's it. And the theory is that all that will at some point be one base money as, as your Twitter handle is like, that will all be uh, Bitcoin uh, once we are at the final stage. It's also interesting when, when we think about that and then also it, it seems like you said like competing with, with those things. Um, but Bitcoin is also competing kind of with real estate and, and with, with other assets uh, to a certain extent because we have a bad base money and that's why people are fleeing to, to all the other places. So kind of we had to, we would have to include in, in that calculation all the other monetary premiums of maybe even like gold and, and uh, other assets uh, in there. That's kind of hard to kind of hard to calculate uh, what, what the full potential then for, for Bitcoin actually is, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good point to uh, theorize, and of course, many people do theorize on this, is how much of this monetary premium, as you said, is uh, people moving away from a weaker currency, as they do, governments, as we know, is in Bitcoin, that's what, why, we, why we do Bitcoin, governments print more than the demand is, you know, to fund their programs, whatever it is, and that uh diminishes the demand for cash balances that people would normally have so they go into something else like you said real estate stocks bonds whatever it might be i don't approach it that way um i do do a lot of charts where you're comparing the growth of stocks or bonds or whatever to bitcoin and i think that's interesting but yeah like you said it's it's hard to calculate and it's not something that i'm uh, i'm doing basically so it's it's there i'm sure and i think that in a hyper bitcoinized world the monetary premium of real estate would come way down you know will it go to zero will it just be you know the actual utility of the real estate i'm not sure i don't know um you know the economy is a, is a wild thing right it's hard to predict sometimes but what we can in point of fact calculate still is this uh is this amount of 
currency that is in the, the world. And we can see how Bitcoin compares to that. And, uh, and then, you know, and then, and then see how the growth goes. And I do think that this is, like I said, this goes back to your first question. It's going to take a long, longer time than people probably think. Um, you know, this is a generational thing. Um, you know, every four years, it seems like a new crop of young people get interested in Bitcoin. That's one theory of how this stuff works. Uh, of course, there's many things going on, obviously, with mining and, and the markets in general. But I, uh, you know, you can have this monetary base value of Bitcoin grow. You can have the value of gold market grow. And gold, by the way, is a is a past base money. It's not really mo money anymore. All those banks and central banks still do hold some gold, about 15 percent of it uh, of the world's total central banks do hold. So, you know, these are different buckets of value and I'm not, I'm not, um, trying to focus so much on like the real estate or whatever, because those things aren't money, you know, at the end of the day, they may have a monetary premium, but they're not money. So, so gold, silver, Bitcoin, monetary base, these are money supplies that I'm focused on because they, uh, they, they have the title of money. Absolutely. It's also interesting. Uh, you mentioned the four year cycle already two times. Um, do you think that four year cycle will, vanish at some point because like the halving impact is not as big anymore we have a lot of different impacts like the etf and stuff like that coming into place is that will, will that still prevail uh, over, over the time yeah i i think it will uh diminish the impact of it will diminish i think it like i said though at least two more halvings uh, you're still going to see a pretty big impact because adoption is still low relative to other valuations other things in the market And we have this, you know, it's a, it's a fairly big shock still to the mining industry, which is not a large industry, actually. Um, you know, you're talking, if you added up the, the revenue of all of the, the coin base, right, the new coins that come out every 10 minutes, plus the fees, you know, you're, you're talking 15, 20 billion, maybe right now, uh, per year in dollar value. And that's, that's a decent sized industry, but there are many industries, you know, oil's like trillion dollar industry. There's a, there's a lot, lot more money sloshing around in other industries. And I think it's going to take a, you got to wait until Bitcoin really gets up to those types of industries to, uh, to see what, what happens, you know, during COVID the, the base money industry itself, by the way, and I could show you a chart if you want, uh, here. Yeah, please, please. Yeah. So this is like just a just the flavor of what I uh, publish sometimes is so here's the here's the uh, the, the total amount of of uh, the monetary base is what I calculate here and so if you look at just the delta it was about 20 trillion dollar equivalent uh, just before COVID January 2020 so 20 21 trillion and then all that COVID COVID uh, money printing in the space of you know basically a year little over a year went up 10 trillion. So <laughs> at this, so the monetary base industry, the industry for printing money increased 10 trillion, uh, during COVID, which is just insane. I mean, it's, it's, it was just an absolute insane amount of money printing. And you can see that they've tried to pull it back down, uh, since then. And now we're at about 26.1 trillion. So I mentioned that as well. And then if you go out, um, this is a, trend line exponential regression you see the fit is really good 99 r squared so we're actually under trend of this worldwide the trend line is about 35 or uh, 30 uh sorry what's it 32 trillion we'll go all the way out to uh two more halvings as i mentioned um you know out past 2032 and you're getting somewhere around the 70 80 trillion dollar Uh, value and it's somewhere around there that I think Bitcoin will will meet that value. Uh, I'm not showing you project, projecting out the market cap and stuff, but you just take my word for it for now that I think that's that's what happens. And uh, this is this is how we can see that stuff like this grows on uh, exponential scale because we put it on log scale, it becomes a straight line. And um, And this is, this is, this is a lot of what my research has been. So it's been collecting all of this data. Uh, I start this chart, you know, since basically the United States went off the gold standard in 1971, started in 1969, December, you know, you had something like a hundred billion dollars, $150 billion dollars in base money here. And then with all the money printing, um, 
it's it's now 26 trillion and was 30 uh, a couple of years ago so and that represents by the way a growth rate of about 12.7 percent per year 12.7 percent so uh bitcoin is on a much faster growth rate by the way the the growth rate of bitcoin's trend line i can show you bitcoin by the way here's bitcoin bitcoin is a power curve so perhaps you've seen on twitter you know people talking about the power regression I also have been working on this since like 2018, drawing charts like this. And uh, a power curve is curved on the log scale. So this is the old Bitcoin price on log scale. It's not a straight line. So it's a little bit, it's an asymptotically decaying curve. But if you looked at the slope of this curve when it was you know, sub one penny back in 2010, now the, the actual regression, the black line, is $80,000. You looked at the slope of that curve, that's like 160% per year, 160% per year, the slope of the curve. And of course it was faster at the beginning, slower now. And the, the slope of the curve right now, precisely right now, like from one day to the next is 45% annualized. So right there, you can see that Bitcoin is growing way, way faster than the monetary base. Monetary base that we just talked about, Cash and coin, the central banks print. Even though we talk about they print a lot of money, a lot, a lot of money, it's only twelve point seven percent per year. Here, Bitcoin grows at forty five percent per year. So, uh, so that's basically uh, the the one growth factor is that the money is just getting debased at a twelve percent rate, and the other growth factor is that people are discovering. Bitcoin and then uh, getting into into a Bitcoin as an adopting. So like the one is the growth factor and the other one is the debasing factor. Yeah. Yeah. And they, you know, they're, they're going to converge together. But uh, like I said, I think you got to wait two more halvings for at least those values to, to match. But then of course you have, like I said, this gradually then suddenly thing, maybe, uh, maybe one big nation state decides to say, all right, we're going to start reserving Bitcoin. We're going to put it on our books. And then that just sends the demand for Bitcoin through the roof. Uh, Will those, said. those, uh, growth charts of the base money, uh, break at some point when there is just like the in event of, of hyperinflation, the event of like, Oh, we, we, we hit that suddenly point in, in, in just debasing our money. Yeah. Um, it's a good question. Uh, no one that I have heard of or read of has been ever able to actually predict a hyperinflation. Okay. I mean, hyperinflations happen all the time. Uh, they happened here where I am in the former Soviet Union in the early 90s. Uh, they happened, uh, you know, they're happening in Argentina right now, although they're kind of settling that down. You know, Zimbabwe goes through these bouts. So, so they, they can happen. People can recognize them and they try to get into more harder currencies or Bitcoin. But I've never, you know, I've read Steve Hankey and some of these economists that talk about this a lot. I've never seen like an indicator that, that can sort of predict when the next hyperinflation could come. But, you know, it doesn't look great for, for uh, all of the currencies together. And going back to this chart, if they continue to, you know, to grow at this 12.7% per year. Uh, but, you know, also, uh, like this was really high here in 20, uh, excuse me, in 2011, 2012, and then also during COVID. So this is like these QE1, 2, and 3 happened here after the global financial crisis. And then during COVID, you can see these are up towards the upper bound. That means it's like really excess printing. And now, you know, now it's back down. So things can go on a lot longer. It's like the Keynes quote, right? Markets can be more irrational for longer than you have capital. <laughs> so uh, that's why Bitcoin's a great safe haven, right? It's just a great place to escape from all this noise, all of these uh, crazy figures and, uh, you know, have a beer or something. And is, is that uh, growth of, uh, as you showed before with the Bitcoin price and uh, the monetary uh, price, is, is that like really correlating where like when, when they print a lot of money, the, the, the price is actually moving? Is, is that uh, uh, really a, a good correlation? From last, yeah, we talked about that actually. I mentioned just briefly, from last uh, peak it did. I need to uh, update a chart. I don't have it for you, unfortunately, right now. But if you can imagine, like, you just look at this chart, right? We, we know that this this big bump happened. Let me take these off. 
So we see that the big bump happened above trend here in 2021, which is the four year cycle after 2017. And if you just line that up, right, with this 2021 here, 2022, there was there was a boost. Um, wasn't as much here, actually. Uh, it kind of seems like that because we were still high here in all these periods. And there was a lot of money printing after the uh, um, global financial crisis. But it wasn't exactly. You see it's kind of pulling down here. And also the Federal Reserve, you know, the the dollar, the, the biggest central bank, uh, essentially the biggest, you know, world's reserve currency central bank, they weren't printing money since 2014, actually. Um, so the point is long roundabout way of saying we, we saw it, we saw it in the last cycle. And if we see it again, it's more confirmation that Bitcoin actually might line up with, with, uh, the rest of the banking system being unsustainable to not, you know, you saw that Powell just dropped uh, the Fed funds uh, 50 basis points a couple weeks ago. You know, it's not that high. It was only five and a half percent now down to five. It's really not that much compared to historical values. You know, it's been up to 20% before in the eighties and that's like been too much, too much pain. Stock markets at an all time high and they're, you know, that's gas to the fire. Like they're going to have to buy more assets if they want to keep these interest rates coming lower. And if they do that, then again, Bitcoin might line up perfectly in the next cycle, 2024, 2025, where uh, it's precisely like you are asking. It's, they're printing more and Bitcoin's screaming higher because of that. It's interesting uh, because uh, a lot of people um, that are right now not in Bitcoin, but a little bit outside of Bitcoin and have interest in Bitcoin, they, they hear that like, oh, Bitcoin is an inflation hedge. And then they're like, oh, yeah, the inflation went up this month, but Bitcoin went down this month, <laughs> uh, which yeah. is always funny for me because the those uh, things are way more complex than just like looking at an inflation number and looking then at a Bitcoin price. But this could be like more um, real world data and, and and confirmation that it actually has an uh, a direct correlation between that and this inflation hedge is not just an, a narrative but actually like uh, with data backed up and like oh uh, that actually is an inflation hedge see here there's money printing going on and the bitcoin price actually reacts to that yeah precisely and i i never use inflation I, i'm sure i'm going to uh come back at that someday just to show some point but i've I've never, for all of my charts and started doing YouTube videos last year, I just, like you said, it's too complicated. Uh, people argue that it's biased, the inflation indices, CPI, PPI. Uh, there's no skin in the game there, right? I mean, if they, you know, if they want for social security in the US, for example, if they want it to be a little bit lower, so they don't have to adjust the cost of living, they, they put it lower. And, and generally they want to make it seem like prices are going lower than they are. So that's why I definitely try to look at things from the supply side. Let's make the judgment first, what's happening on the supply side, and then we can maybe infer what's happening on the uh, on the demand side. Is that the, the the most interesting chart that you're currently looking at? Is is like is the is that the, the most interesting metric that you you're looking? Or what, what is from you the most interesting chart to that you look the most on? Uh, I got a couple. I mean, here is an interesting one. Um, this is the US federal uh, debt and it's it's let's just clear it up here for you this is the u.s federal debt total uh all the way back to the to the signing of the constitution 1780s and you know u.s even andrew jackson got the debt down to zero although he was not very good to the native americans so you know it's it's never easy in politics right and um the civil war happened here exploded the national debt uh, but if you look at all these curves on linear scale, they always just fly up to the right. And it's just like all, always how it looks like. Remember not really what you're looking at. You see World War II, national debt spikes up, right? Still, you're talking like millions and billions of dollars here. And now all of a sudden we're at trillions. Uh, September month end, $35.4 trillion of US debt. Okay. And this is publicly tradable debt, right? These are bonds. And, um, central bank owns a significant portion of that. Okay. And uh, I, I show that here. So this green, it's very similar to the monetary base that I talked about, but this is the asset side of this, of just the fed, right? Not the whole 
world, as I showed you in that other um, slide. And so just the Federal Reserve and just their treasury holdings, which is basically the whole balance sheet, they got up to $8.5 trillion at the peak of COVID when the uh, total debt was $30.5 trillion. So if you do a ratio of that, it's 30%, almost. It's a huge number, 28% it peaked at. And you know that means 30 cents out of every dollar was basically printed at this point uh, by the central bank. And that is a record. If I reset the zoom, you can see the only time it was a really big peak before the modern times, before global financial crisis was during Vietnam. So you see here Vietnam, uh, it ended for the United States in 1975. And uh, it only goes down because the U.S. actually prints more debt. It's uh, sorry, uh, issues more debt, but the Federal Reserve doesn't buy more debt. <laughs> so that was like 15, uh, 18 percent. It, it peaked out here in, in 1975 and we've gone all the way up to 30 percent. Now, what happens in hyperinflationary economies? Well, this is basically the central bank is going to buy all the debt because no one wants to hold the debt. No one wants to hold the money. So it's a very like vicious circle type of a thing. Now, they've been, still been trying to normalize it, as they say. You can see these lines here, this QE1, 2, and 3 uh, from the global financial crisis and then COVID. Just massive amounts of money printing, buying the debt. Now, they're trying to normalize. So now it's down to about 18.8%. Uh, but like we just talked about, they have declared that they're going to start, uh, they're going to start dropping interest rates, which means bu buying more assets, printing money to buy more assets in the future. And I expect this, if they want to keep these interest rates lower for longer, you're going to, ex you're going to see this number turn around soon enough. So uh, again, it's gasoline on the fire for a hard asset like Bitcoin, which can't be debased in that manner. And I also don't, um, I don't say any of this stuff like with particularly glee, you know, you got a lot of Bitcoiners who want, who want the sort of the world to burn for Bitcoin to fly. Obviously don't want that to happen. And I don't necessarily think that's going to happen. Um, I think it's going to, they're going to try to manage this the best they can. And uh, they're learning from things that, you know, quote unquote learning, they, they're learning from things in the past and in the central bankers opinion, it's more liquidity will solve and stave off these hard landings. Of course, you and I, I'm sure, don't agree with that. It's because, you know, that's just kicking the can down the road, making things worse later on. But that's really the only tool that they have, and they're going to continue to do that. So again, like I said, 5.5% was too hot. It's too hard for, uh, for a lot of people in the economy right now. So that's why they've decided to drop rates. And once they do that, you're going to see more money printing. Is there a correlation to to how they are buying uh, gold or how much gold the the central banks are, are holding? Uh, other countries in the world uh, are increasing a little bit, but it's not much, honestly, in the grand scheme. Uh, don't have a chart for that at the moment. I can just unshare my screen here, but the Federal Reserve hasn't changed its gold holdings in like. 20 years, something like this. I mean, it's, oh, uh, wow. yeah. And it's very small amount, you know, that figure that I just showed you, uh, the treasuries were eight and a half trillion dollars of assets. The total balance sheet, the total assets are 9 trillion. So there's something like 500 billion there. And that's mostly the difference is corporations. They hold some corporate debt. Uh, it's like a, it's like a nominal value of gold for the United States. Very small. Um, and people even wonder if it's even there because, Alan Greenspan, the former Fed of the uh, former uh, chairman of the Fed in the '90s, made this statement that central banks stand by, ready to sell gold should the price rise. So it's a very uh, monopolistic statement, basically saying uh, we have a lot of gold. We don't like it when gold outshines the dollar, so we're going to sell our gold to suppress the gold price should the price rise. He actually said it; like it's in writing. You can see it in the minutes. The quote is there. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of conspiracy theories about this. Like uh, people say that they sold too much and now they don't have it. And they're just saying that they're, they're recording the assets on their books. So it is an asset says gold, the gold account. They're recording it like it, like it's there, but really it's, it's all been leased out to the different banks and, and sold. And, uh, 
they just have a receivable now. Like they don't actually have the gold sitting in the vault. So that's, that's a whole other conspiracy theory. But that's just the U.S. It is true. China uh, is buying some more gold. Uh, but even there, it's, it's actually a s much smaller proportion of their balance sheet than holding these bonds, these uh, treasury bonds, European bonds, Japanese government bonds. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your bitbox. And the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual. You have to have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really really wrong and through all those steps the bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step and if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash robin you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty and last but not least i have something completely new for you guys i partnered up with coin vigilante this is the most beautiful bitcoin timepiece that i ever saw created by anyone look at that beauty i love it so much coin vigilante made an perfect bitcoin watch that's the perfect subtle elegant way to go out there and show that you are a bitcoiner and that watch brand is bitcoin only and coin vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing genesis edition of their watch collections you have the date of the first ever mined bitcoin block in there and of course also the block height and which epoch we are currently in i love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece and make sure to check out those amazing coin vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions i love those watches so so much it's interesting for me when when i look it's it seems like the biggest fear uh, that bitcoiners could have is uh that all those governments and central banks all of a sudden uh, act in a rational way and not print anymore, but that would probably just not work. Like, like the, the point of, of that even being a possibility seems to be already vanished uh, for, for, for me, right? Or, or is, that still, <laughs> is that still a possibility that governments actually can reverse that, that trend that is going on for, for so long? Let me show you this picture. So here's uh, similar to what I just talked about. Uh, this is now showing you the balance sheet of both sides. So assets always equal liabilities. That's the accounting identity. Um, on the asset side, we talked about as the bonds. On the liability side, this is actually this base money I was talking about. So let's just look before the global financial crisis in the US. Let's go from back to the even start of the Vietnam War. On the top, you have the treasuries that the United States Federal Reserve has held. Okay. And as I said, right around here in the seventies, this was 15% of the total debt, 18% of the total debt uh, of the United States, the federal reserve itself owned. And how did they buy that money? They bought it with their liabilities, which is in this black portion. And the black is actually physical currency. So this is right here is like literally how the sausage is made when people talk about the printing press and all central banks do is print. And like you said, it's just a, it's a trend. And it is indeed what they do. I mean, you can very rarely see that the black, we're not even talking about the bank reserves yet, but the black portion of this chart goes down. You can see here, and there's a little bit of a bump here in December, 1999, then it goes down. What was that? That was actually Y2K. Um, when Y2K happened, a lot of people got scared. People take money out of the bank and the, the Federal Reserve had to print extra cash there that they thought, okay, actually we're going to rein this in. So they destroyed some cash in the year 2000 when things were fine. <laughs> but it's like a, such a small thing compared to what typically happens. Again, just looking over this sort of post-World War II period up until the global financial crisis, they're always printing money. And, and, and that's literally how they bought the bonds. Typically, they, they would 
print the cash. This is physical cash. There was there's 12 Federal Reserve banks in the U.S. They take the cash on pallets. They deliver them to banks. But the banks don't just like get the money for free. They're like, well, what do I got to do to take this cash? Like, well, give us some of the government bonds that you bought in the market. We're going we're gonna to take it on our books now. And that's what happens. That's how money comes into existence. And um, so I'm just trying to affirm basically with your, your thesis. It always goes up. They always, uh, you know, the demand for cash generally goes up. And you can see in the black there, it's always gone up. Even during COVID, it went a little bit more. Now, this what's this dark green area on the bottom? That's the bank reserve portion. So um, this is what I've talked about. And, you know, this is it basically just mirrors the other side. There's some other stuff going on we don't have to talk about during the show. But um, it, it, you'll notice that the negative monetary base doesn't, it's, it's, it's a bit less than the total treasuries. But... Uh, this is this is what they do. This is what they do. They just print the money to bring it into existence. And very rarely, like here, notice how I said before the US hasn't printed money since 2014. So this is this is true. The, the treasuries were flat. They weren't buying any more treasuries. And the monetary base on the bottom there is flat. It was uh, about negative, uh, not negative, it's just on the negative axis there. It was $3.8 trillion. And by 2019, uh, and it was $3.2 trillion. So this was a little bit of a destruction of money, but mostly it was the destruction of those bank reserves, as I talked about at the beginning of the show, the, the account that each bank has. And then, of course, COVID happened. They need an excuse. They need to print money again, and off you go. So, uh, again, a long-winded way of, I think, answering your question that usually they, uh, they print. And actually, one more thing, just to go back to the beginning here. Notice a discrepancy here in the United States' case before World War II. So before World War II, you see that these treasury value, this treasury value is much lower than the monetary base. See the monetary base is like five, six billion here in the twenties. Um, you know, whatever you can say, 16 billion, I'll take out the physical currency just so you see what I'm talking about. The dark green at the bottom. That's, you see that's 17 billion in the 19, like the eve of World War II for the US, but they only owed, they only owned 2 billion of treasuries. This is the central bank. Of course, everything changed here uh, when the U.S. got into World War II and, and we also went to the Bretton Woods Conference with the new dollar gold standard. But here, what was mostly the asset on the book of the Federal Reserve at this time? It was gold. It was gold, actually. So I'm not showing it, but the gap here between how much money they were printing and then the asset side, which you can't see, you, you see very little treasuries here. Uh, the assets were filled up primarily by gold. And also some corporate bonds because they actually were more buying, uh, you know, lending money to companies uh, and banks, not 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 the not the government in the early days. So it shows you how things change. And now it's just like all they do is buy government bonds. They they simplified it. <laughs> yeah. It's just what, what do you think? Uh, because um, I. I guess you had the opinion that we at some point uh, at a Bitcoin standard where we don't have that fiat money or do you think fiat money will, will always exist? Yeah, another good question. Big picture question. Uh, I think about it often uh, and I think that at the end of the day, it's going to be a question of how strong uh, these liberal democracies and I, 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 I'm not... I really do believe that, you know, I live here in Eastern Europe, so we're, we're at risk of war with, uh, with Russia all the time, like Ukraine is. And um, obviously the world is sliding back into authoritarianism. It's really bad. It's, it's, it's tough times. But uh, still, the strongest thing that a liberal democracy has is the value of its currency, as you can see here. And, they, you know, they do their best to destroy it with more government programs and more spending it's not good. It's not, it's definitely not good. It's why we want to get into Bitcoin. But as long as they can keep that uh, position relatively strong and, you know, you have open markets and you have private property and you have these things that I think that the currency will, will stick around. And I certainly think it's going to stick around for a couple more generations. You know, like I said, uh, based on these projections that I made in uh, this chart here. You know, 
there's nothing here that shows me in this chart. Like this is a huge, a huge R squared. Like this chart is just growing very systematically at this 12 and a half percent growth rate a year. As long as, you know, and even autocracies, by the way, they want their currency to print more money and steal stuff as well, which autocracies do. And I, I know that like sarcastic libertarians listening to this will think that all, all governments steal. You know, I understand those, those arguments, but they're, they're going to hold on to their currency as long as they can. And um, I think that the transition will occur when, as already happened with, you know, El Salvador and some nations, when they start taking Bitcoin on as a reserve asset, as a treasury, instead of holding those bonds, those treasury bonds that hold more Bitcoin, that will add to the, uh, that hyper Bitcoinization and that will add to that sort of base money situation being represented by Bitcoin. But even in that case, I still think they're going to want to hold on to the dollar, you know, and, uh, or the Euro. And so even if they hold, you know, 20% of their assets in Bitcoin, they're still going to want to do what they can with, with the Euro regulate it, tax it, all the rest. And unless we get into some anarcho capitalist paradise, which I don't see happening anytime soon. Um, I think the best, well, the best case is that they just start reserving Bitcoin. So what do you think will happen with, with, with all that debt, it's, it's, it's really interesting for me to see like there's a, a, a huge um, debt uh, in, in all the countries, basically. Uh, it's just increasing. It's just like it's just going up uh, in, in, in every year uh, on a bigger trend, at least. Uh, and then at some point, they just like f find a new currency. So like the, the unit is then uh, again lower. So because people don't want to buy with like 200 euros, just like one eyes, they, they want maybe like one euro. For that, so they have to invent new currencies. What, what do you think will will happen at some point? With the, are we just like in that uh, loop where we uh, create a new fiat currency all uh, twenty five to fifty years? Yeah, it's another interesting question. You know, Japan uh, actually has a totally different culture with this. Uh, they expunge debt a lot. They haven't uh, necessarily expunged the the government debt that foreigners hold, Japanese government bonds, but Internally, they expunge debt very much more uh, easily than the West does. The, it's very the West doesn't do it as much. Uh, the United States doesn't do it as much. It's it's kept it all on its books. And the United States does kind of as you're alluding to this soft soft default. They just roll it over, extend it. If they don't have the taxes to pay it down, they print more, which is every year they never have enough. You know, they don't balance the budget, so. You know, the debt is simply an increase of more deficits. A deficit is your negative spending per year. And so that they, they don't, it always increases. Um, it gets back to this point of, you know, a question of what's the breaking point. I think it's a, there's a multitude of factors there. Um, weirdly and scarily, I think probably war is a part of this. You know, we're seeing a more militant world, more uh, armed world. And um, that might play a factor. You know, who's the winner, who's the losers in certain, these th certain scenarios here. But um, it has occurred often in the past. And when I said the past, I mean like the past few millennia, that, that, that it does become unsustainable, unmanageable, and they do have these debt jubilees. Uh, that's an idea. Uh, I don't know enough about them to know like the regularity or if that could happen or how good of an idea that is or what that means for the dollar but they certainly happen and like you said as well about the extra currencies actually in this uh, chart that i'm showing you here let me take the, the trend lines off you know like here in the in the 80s and the 70s i am including the two countries in particular in latin america that have always done this as brazil and argentina they've gone through like six currencies each six or seven each in the last 50 years and that's included uh you know the dollar value you know if you looked at it in the native unit you know it, it's like flies up right but the dollar value is roughly the same and then it just resets and it's the same it's pretty funny so so the dollar is our numeraire here and it's uh it's a hard concept to sort of understand sometimes because that would be i guess the real x factor is if people completely you know lose faith in the dollar uh, because that has been our numeraire since World War II. 
And, you know, again, not, not a scenario I'm necessarily hoping for. I think that would be probably a lot of chaos and, and difficulties, but, uh, again, the best way to prevent your own personal or family finances to fall in that trap is, as obviously you and I know, is just to buy a little Bitcoin. It's a, it's a, it's a big protection against that. Yeah. It's interesting when you look at like countries where there is a, a lot of inflation, uh, like Turkey, Argentina, and, and all those countries, they mostly use uh, US dollar or some, some like a, a, a better fiat currency than they have on on their own, and they don't flee in 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 masses to to Bitcoin. Even though in those countries usually Bitcoin adoption is higher than than in other ones, uh, but uh, they, they still like go to the to the next best uh, broken mm. money and not to the not broke money, which is which is an interest, interesting um, observation, uh, I guess. Uh, and then, like the big question is like, what happens if like the the best one, the 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 seemingly at least least broken one uh, with the USD, um, what happens if that actually has like a hyperinflation of like a hundred or two hundred percent a year, uh, or maybe even like a month or something like that, like really crazy numbers? Then it's like, oh, people will flee to the gold. Bitcoin and all, all all those things that that could be an that could be a crazy and probably also very scary uh, time for even for Bitcoiners I think because uh, there's so much uncertainty and we, we know like how, how many Bitcoiners are you in your bigger family uh, you most likely one of few and and not everyone adopts this. I try to keep get everyone on board, but uh, mo <laughs> mostly you are the the only Bitcoiner in like uh, bigger family. So it will it will be an interesting point, and I'm always curious how, how this will play out. And I think you are one of the best guests for for that. No, I mean I agree. I agree. It's uh, it's anything can happen. It's anyone's guess there, and how those sort of uh, the crack up boom as it's called that's how Mises referred to it um you know I what I will say is if you look at some other indicators it's still it's simply just currency exchange rates still seems that the dollar is this uh it's the best looking horse in the glue factory as I like to say so the uh you know the there it, it seems like actually let me show you one more time actually it seems like in this chart uh Am I on log? Let me take it off log. All right. So it seems in this chart, right? We're at 30 trillion in December, 2021. And then in June, 2024, it's down to 26.12 trillion. So it seems like actually 4 trillion was removed from the system. As I said, they can destroy money, right? And make the currency stronger. But actually what's happening here is there, some did, some went down a little bit. But really what's happening is more, th this is again, it's a Wittgenstein's ruler thing. It's like the numeraire thing. What's really happening more than central banks decreasing the, the currencies is that the value of their currency in dollar terms is falling. That's more of what's happening there than they're decreasing the value of their currencies in circulation. And you just sort of have to, have to, um, take my word on that for now. I have another chart you, you can find on my YouTube video about or YouTube channel about these things, but uh, it's, 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 uh, it's more the case that the, that this decrease in this green is not because they're trying to shore up the currency. It's more that the value of those currencies, you know, like the, uh, the yen or the Euro or, you know, the Brazilian real or the Indian rupee is just falling in value against the dollar. Uh, so that's why it, it, it looks lower. It looks lower than uh, it would be if you could look at all 50 of these currencies. There's 50 currencies in here. If you could look at them all in native terms, like you would still see them kind of flat or even rising a little bit still, still. Ah, okay. It's just the dollar amount, uh, what they're actually worth is going down and not uh, the... The units. The units of, the yeah. Units of it, yeah. M yeah. Makes sense a lot. Um, now we, let's come to uh more of like the 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 positive side of it and and adopting and, and counting how do you see it currently is is the us uh the the fastest horse right now of the big countries obviously like there's el salvador there's Bhutan, uh but they are quite small compared mm -hmm. to the 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 really big players like europe like us like china like in the like all those bigger 
uh, players, uh, El Salvador and, and, and Buda. And I think El Salvador is a little smaller than Austria. Uh, I think uh, Austria would be an amazing country for Bitcoin standard. If mm. Austrian economics, I would love that, but I don't see it anytime soon. Yeah. Uh, do, do you see the US in, in the lead right now? Uh, I don't know, to be honest. I don't know. I, I haven't, uh, it's harder to check the pulse on those things rather than seeing, you know, what they're doing. Um, you know, you have also the CBDC thing which by the way, those charts that I just showed you, uh, that, that, that is analogous to CBDCs as well. So this I told you about the physical currency, told you about the bank reserves. There's, there will be a third component of this government based money. That's going to come. That's a complete LARP on Bitcoin. And that is the CBDC. So, you know, China has a little bit, they're very small right now. Like some of them are even included in that chart I showed you, like with China and stuff, it's like extremely small figures pilot projects mostly they're gonna they're gonna run with that that's something we haven't really talked about but they're gonna run with that for a while and they're gonna see if the adoption there can help or if people use it more conveniently than they would you know another digital currency like bitcoin or stable coin i think i think that that's it's it's gonna take some time to work through there and uh, you know the us is talking about maybe stable coins uh being a a bucket of demand value that can buy up, you know, sop up these extra treasuries. And that's true. It can be, but that's still so, again, these are so small figures compared to, first of all, compared to Bitcoin and second of all, compared to the debt. Um, you know, the United States debt, as I just showed you 35, what's the value of, you know, tether it's like a hundred billion, 115 billion. I mean, this no way that the, Tether investors are going to save the dollar, you know, and say, so, so in, in those, for those examples, I think that again, these are more headwinds against the fiat currency system. They're more tailwinds for Bitcoin. So, yeah, I do think that, uh, you know, there's some possibility that these things could be added to a reserve asset. Uh, but again, I, I, I don't see it in the next, for the next two cycles, to be honest. Um, how, how big is actually... Wrong. How, how big is actually Bitcoin already compared to the to the other currencies? Obviously, uh, smaller than the US, but uh, is is it like uh, on, on the ranking side? I think like rank five or six or something like that. What I saw. Yeah, if you took out gold, just because gold is included in my list, but if you took out gold, it's number five. It has passed uh, the Bank of England's balance sheet, and it did that in February of this year. So. You have the dollar, you have the euro, you have the yen, you have the yuan, Chinese yuan, those big four currencies. And then after that, you have now Bitcoin at 1.2 trillion. Uh, that is that is bigger. The, the, the UK balance sheet uh, is about a trillion uh, sterling, a trillion pounds sterling. And it it's uh, it's actually right at it right now with this little dip in Bitcoin, but at, you know, at sixty two, sixty three thousand dollar Bitcoin, sixty five, it's fir it's firmly above it. Um, just depends on the exchange rate at the moment, but it's it's uh, it's broken above it. So again, more more reason to believe that people are finding Bitcoin as this hard money asset as opposed to any other asset out there or real estate, like you said. It's kind of crazy when you think about it. Like uh, if if you think about Bitcoin as a nation. Uh, and a nation that just was founded like 15 years ago, and it's already like the fifth strongest uh, financial asset. Uh, it, that that's kind of kind of really uh, crazy to think about that. Uh, with with like yes, like companies also have been shot up to uh, like uh, really big um, uh, valuations, but uh, they have a marketing team, they have some products that they sell to to, to customers and stuff like that. Um, Bitcoin is completely voluntary. There's, nobody is forcing anyone to adopt Bitcoin. And the other, the other thing is actually true. Like people are actually trying really hard that people not get into Bitcoin. Like the, yeah. m most of them, and there are really big campaigns against it that are funded really nicely. Also, uh, it's it's kind of fascinating that that we are already at this point just after like yeah a decade basically of, of the discovery. Absolutely incredible. Yeah, in 15 years that it's. The number five currency and then if you if you uh lob in gold which is about it's up to about 15 trillion because gold is at a big run this year it's about 2600 dollars an ounce and if you do the math on all that and then the ounces outstanding uh that are non-industrial gold you get something like a 15 trillion dollar valuation 
Uh, again, that's a very loose number. And, you know, you have gold that's in jewelry, gold that's in central banks, you have gold that's in private banks. But that would be, in my view, that's the big, that's the big one that really is going to be interesting to see if Bitcoin overtakes. If gold just completely reverts to like a, a jewelry sort of thing. And like, it's, it has no, you know, people are like wondering why, why do we have these bars? You know, really like War Warren Buffett used to joke. I mean, Warren Buffett hates Bitcoin as well, but he hates gold and he used to joke probably still jokes that like, why, why do we spend resources digging gold out of the ground and then putting it back in the ground in a vault in a central bank? Like, what's the point? And uh, he's right to some extent. It is true that if you hodl an asset like even gold, you're not adding economic value. You're just preserving yourself against a destruction of a possible other asset, which your wealth can be denominated in, you know, another unit of account. So that, that's all that you're doing if you hodl. And it's true with Bitcoin, by the way. Uh, you do need to lend it out to get it into the economy. Of course, they go crazy with their lending, as we talked about. But, uh, you know, so it, there's a lot of push pull there. It's, it's going to take time. You work it out. And, um, you know, I, I, I think there's there's a lot of tailwinds for, for Bitcoin, like we said at the top of the show, especially if, if they're going to keep these rates lower for longer now and, and, and start this sustained push to print a little bit more money. That's that lines up right again with the four year cycle. Yeah, but I think the 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 value proposition of of holding something that holds your own financial energy, I mean that's that's kind of the biggest market ever. <laughs> that's the biggest biggest problem uh, you can solve for someone. Like you, you work for something and you get energy from that. Like however you, you get energy from the financial energy, uh, that that's saving into the future. Uh, that's like the the biggest the biggest thing ever. You 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 brought up uh lending and and, and borrowing do, do you think that's a good idea to to borrow against your bitcoin and 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 basically maybe even like go short fiat when you when you see all those those charts well, how, how do you think about that yeah i mean well I, I never financial advice let's say that never financial advice but uh borrowing against an asset like Bitcoin is, in my opinion, much better than lending against it. I, mean, I, would, I would not, you know, you gotta, you gotta convince me that the interest rate of Bitcoin is pretty high to part with my Bitcoin while, you know, while the asset could be going up in big value in the next year, for example, right? And plus, I have the the I have the uh, the possibility that you will not pay me back, that you're not gonna make good on that Bitcoin, right? So lending it would be very, uh, I would, in my opinion, unadvisable, but borrowing against it, um, you know, you know, post it as collateral, borrow against it, buy more Bitcoin, never financial advice. But yeah, if, if we're in this, uh, if we're in this FOMO stage for the next year, it, it actually only makes economic sense to do that. Um, but you, you gotta be careful with that. You always gotta be careful with leverage because you can get stopped out. You can have too much in your interest payments you can't afford so on and so forth so yeah that's that yeah, i do think so too it's like uh, overall it's a good concept but uh there can be one small detail in in the overall deal that really burns you down in the in the in the, in the short or long long run you should always i think um uh I think Sailor said it in the beginning when in 2021 it was uh, really hyped uh, where like borrowing against the bitcoin also with celsius it was a big topic uh back then obviously that didn't turn out good <laughs> yeah uh but he also s said uh like if you're not prepared for bitcoin to go down 90 percent and you can still hold it and you're still fine uh you you probably should not do it uh and uh, it, it's a i think it's a good good way to think about it but in a, right. in, a in a general way if we think now of a world very far down the road uh, where actually Bitcoin is the base money and we don't have the debt system anymore. Again, very far down the road. Um, what role does debt and lending and borrowing then play if we have money uh, in Bitcoin as something appreciating in value, not depreciating, and uh, the kind of the, the hurdle rate, new hurdle rate is, is Bitcoin? Does that change debt systems where like people just like, work for something and don't take tap for it or uh, how does this in also impact like um, that that whole thing with debt and maybe even like venture capitalism yeah that's one of the theories uh, I'm not as hardcore as some Bitcoin analysts perhaps that think like debt's going to completely go away and 
you're just going to have such a sound asset that appreciates constantly that, you know, why would you have any loans? I do think that it has been evident, even with very stable gold systems, that people actually just prefer a little bit more interest and a little bit less safety. Um, now gold is still different, granted, but you, you can look back at some of these free banking systems in Scotland and Canada uh, in the 1700s, the 1800s, um, where they didn't have a central bank. They didn't have a systemically increasing money supply, as we talked about uh, already on this show with the Federal Reserve's balance sheet as an example, or I showed you the 50 currencies. You still increase credit, and actually people wanted to do that. How that looks, I have no idea, right? Is it, uh, is it for short-term credit only, short-term working capital? I don't know, but I, I do have a hard time believing that if you want to take some future value of the productivity that you hope to deliver to the market, by definition, that means you're going to need to take, you know, a loan. And of course, you're going to have to convince the investors that you can outcompete the accreting value of Bitcoin, which like, as we just talked about, that's why I would never loan Bitcoin right now, because you can't offer me 45% return, I wouldn't trust it based on uh, how you're going to hold the collateral, how safe is the, you know, how, how safe is my collateral posted there, whatever. I'd be happy to do it the other way and borrow against it, but, but lending, I wouldn't. So if we do get to that point, like you said, way down the road where it's, it's, it's a calm, stable, sustainable asset, it's truly the risk-free asset, right? Like no reason to hold treasuries, no reason to hold gold. Uh, you just hold Bitcoin. Um, yeah, it's going to be pretty hard to, uh, beat that return but i still think people are going to try i mean you know it's it's you're, you're simply just borrowing from the future of the productivity that you think you can deliver it's all that you do when you when you take a loan um man i i think that 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 process would still would still exist might look very different might be only short term might be in some sort of a factoring arrangement with your you know invoices or whatever but uh i have a hard time believing that it it won't be there uh, it's a human nature to 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 get something from it uh and do something uh more than uh than the average i guess uh, there's always just like uh you, you want to do something more and want to be creative with it it will be interesting to see i'm really looking forward to that what do you think is the 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 biggest impact that bitcoin will have on on the world maybe even like shorter term uh, that we can see in like maybe in already in 10 20 30 years from now sorry repeat the question what's the shorter term yeah what's what's the the biggest impact you think that bitcoin will have on the world even like shorter yeah. term 10 20 years from now mm -hmm. well i do think that uh more productive investments is one i think that less profligate spending is another uh, by governments and by, you know, companies with wild and crazy ideas, right? And this goes back to exactly the point we were just talking about, right? You're going to have a, a solid risk-free asset that's accreting in value while you, dear government, are offering, you know, these bonds, which, you know, you cannot even pay back and you spend too much and the programs aren't good. Those things are, there's a real challenge to to governments around the world and to companies around the world. So I think that that's going to in turn make better uh, products and goods and services and better decisions from the people that uh, govern us. So I think that that's all great. And I think that, uh, you know, the old Bitcoin fixes this saying uh, will really apply to a lot of industries. I don't think every industry, I don't think, you know, again, not to bring it back too much to the, to the military stuff, but uh, over here in Eastern Europe, like we have been concerned, not just since 2022, but for, you know, for 10 years when Russia reinvaded Crimea, like this was something in Europe, we said never again, it's not going to happen again. And now it's happening. And, you know, war is politics by other means. Uh, we are now into, we're, we're going back into a war cycle of, of, of economies, hopefully not full blown World War Three. that would uh, never be obviously the war is never good, and we already see what happened in the Middle East. We see what's happening in Ukraine, but every country now in Europe is increasing their spending, and this is just something that, like, Bitcoin has no effect on this. It has no effect on this. It's 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 uh, talk about nuclear proliferation. We talk about nuclear risks from Russia. Talk about what China is doing. Bitcoin has zero effect on this. That's 
it's just a fact. Uh, you can say what we want about Austrian economics or freedom. And, and I love these conversations on a global level, like on a, on a broad level, but, um, you know, you're, you, the U.S. is already spending a trillion dollars a year on its military, and it's going to increase, as is every other country in Europe right now. So scary, but and I hope that you know cooler heads can prevail there. But I, I do think that there are other, there certainly are other factors in the world than than Bitcoin, and we're we're a long way from like the pure utopia. Yeah, that, that's 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 definitely uh, for sure. Uh, like even if we are uh, coming there where everything is peaceful, and and I do hope so, but uh, I'm, I'm skeptical more and more. Uh, it's it's 100 a very long time uh, till then. Perfect. Then let's come closer to the end where I ask all my guests the same question: um, What can we learn from you besides Bitcoin? Mm. Well, uh, you can learn how wonderful. Eastern Europe is come join me in the Baltics anytime. Uh, just ping me on Twitter or whatever. Uh, can show you why capitalism is a good thing and communism is a bad thing because uh, the Balts are a great example of breaking free from the communist chains that they had uh, for 50 years and are doing everything they possibly can to not have uh, be invaded again. And uh, you know, come to come to Latvia, buy you a beer and uh we talk talk about free markets i love that a lot really cool uh our end routine in the podcast is where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest uh without knowing who the next guest is and i guess you already answered that one right now um what is the best city in the world for bitcoiners to travel to <laughs> come to riga come to the honey badger next year for sure Ah, uh, really cool. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Matthew, for for being on my show. Um, when people want to find you, reach out to you, ask you questions, where so I can find you. Yep, thank you, Robin. Appreciate it. I'm at One Base Money on uh, most all platforms. You can find me at that handle, and uh, I do a lot of charts on YouTube now. I've been doing that for a year, um, as well as the Crypto Voices podcast on Spotify or uh, any other place. Really cool. Thank you so much for being on. Also, thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening uh, uh, for joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.